Along with that, uh, we have the mayor from your cruise director staff coming around with a microphone. And if you have any questions, raise your hand nice and high. Uh, questions are nice, comments are always nice as well. And uh, also, uh, let us know what your name is, where you're from, and we go from there. Sound good, Cap? Sounds good to me. All right. Anybody? Well, thank you very much for joining us here this morning. We appreciate your time for the Sorry. Anybody? Any questions? All right, down here in the front. Yes, sorry. Right. Just one second. Let's get a microphone your way. My name's Jeff from Boston, Texas. What do you like about your jobs and why? What do you like about our jobs and why? That's a great question. Yeah. I don't know. I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I don't know. You know, where do you start? I, I just, uh, I suppose you could say that, you know, it's an honor and pleasure to be here on this amazing ship. Uh, that's, that's for sure. I've been here now 20 years. So I've been on a number of different ships and on different itineraries. I've experienced a lot when I think of all the things that I've learned and experiences I've had since the last 20 years. Um, I suppose all of that combined is why I'm still here. I mean, it's, it's never changed or ever changing. And it's, um, I learn something every day. It's, it's a very dynamic uh, environment. And whenever you're dealing with a lot of people, guests and crew, uh, the possibilities are unlimited. So I'm always surprised every day by what people are capable of. <laughs> you're not speaking of me specifically, are you? No. Okay, thank well, you. Well, yeah. uh, from my angle, I, I, I'll kind of sum it up as, uh, I suppose in one word, it's happiness. Um, but to give you a little bit more of a deeper example, uh, two of my best friends uh, back home that I grew up with, uh, one is in the medical profession, and the other is an auditor for Union Pacific Railroad. And I joined this company 15 years ago, and kind of on a whim, and of course they started giving me the, you know, a little bit of grief, saying, oh, you don't have a real job, you know, that sort of thing. And I turned it into a career, and uh, at the end of the day, I can always just say, hey, listen guys, and I still give them a lot of grief for this, so when you guys walk into a room, nobody wants to see you. They're either ill or they're being audited. I get to walk into a room and I have a thousand people, two thousand people, six thousand people looking at me going, what are we going to do next? This is fun. So we really get to see people at their best. You guys relaxed on vacation, you switched off, switched off from your phone and your emails and your work and your television screens and your news outlets. Can we get rid of some of the news channels anyway? Uh, can we just, you're kind of switched off. So we see everybody at the best, which it kind of sums up, it's a, it's a positive environment to be in. And uh, the nice thing is, is we've had the opportunity to make a, a, nice, uh, a nice living on it as well. So thank you very much. That was a great question to start things off. Next question right over here. Falls, New York. Uh, how long is the ship? How much fuel do you use? Uh, and so forth. How long is the ship? Or how long is the trip? <laughs> how long is the ship? The ship is uh, 1,188 feet and six inches. Depending on the, the six inches is very important. <laughs> you want to know why? Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Ken. Because <laughs> the Harmony is 1,188 feet. And we are 1,188 feet and 6 inches. Two inches makes a big difference to some people. Yes. Thanks for the question. How much fuel do we burn? We burn a lot. On this um, itinerary, we'll burn about 1,000 tons in one week. So that's a lot of fuel. But if you divide it by all the people with all the miles, it's about 80 miles to the gallon per person. So that's not too bad. It's pretty good. You know, we get to take our whole house with us. We're trying to do that with 80 miles to the gallon on anything else. But um, yeah, we we have enough fuel. I get the question too often about fuel. So we we carry about 4,000 tons, and you know. Realistically, we can sail three weeks and still have fuel in our tanks. So that means that we could basically cross the Atlantic over and back without refueling. Not that we would do that, but we could if we had to. And we would still have enough in our tanks to make it safe. 
usually you use a rule of thumb of keeping no less than 20%. That said, I've never seen less than 40%. So we, we manage it like that. And uh, Captain, in, uh, in uh, St. Mark, did we go to St. Mark this week? Yes. I am so yes, lost. St. Mark, we did, we, did. We, uh, we fueled up. Is that the, was yeah. that the barge that was on the side? Yeah, that was the barge. Yeah, so that uh, our fuel tank, our, our gas station basically comes to us. So if you saw that big uh, tanker outside in St. Martin, uh, that was uh, that was the chief engineer down there filling up. Did you see him? He had his hand on the nozzle all day long. He's <laughs> a little sore after a while. Yeah, you should see him when he switched to critic. <laughs> Does he have to make something? Yeah, he, well, he's not saying much about it. But um, yeah, we, we pumped that barge dry, and we only took 1,500 tons. So that gives you an idea of the volume. Yeah. All right, next question right back. Uh, my name's Dean, I'm from Orlando. Uh, two part question, so can you explain the pilot load process coming in uh, port and also how many people are on the bridge at a time? Well, uh, people on the bridge, it really depends, arrivals and departures or whether we're just sitting in port. So um, when we're at sea, like we are now, um, really good conditions, not much traffic. We have first officer, second officer, and a quartermaster. Sometimes just the first officer and the quartermaster with the second officer on call. Um, he might be out on the ship doing something and on a short leash to come to the bridge if too many phone calls or whatever. At night, it's the three of them for sure. If we're in confined waters, we add another officer and another quartermaster. So we would have either the senior officer, so chief officer, chief officer safety, or staff captain, or even myself, uh, plus the two officers and two quartermasters. For arrival or departure, it's all of us. So it would be myself, staff captain, chief officer, or the chief officer safety. We have two chief officers. Uh, one first officer, one second officer, and two quartermasters. Now, sometimes we take a pilot. It depends on the port. Some ports require it, some ports don't. Most ports in the world do. And basically, he's the port representative. He's in charge of the traffic of ships coming and going from the port. And his role in that respect is as a local advisor, and he'll provide communications, um, assisting with um, traffic control, ship traffic control. And um, basically, his responsibility lies with the port. So his interest is taking care of the port and making sure you know nothing bad happens. And my interest is the ship, making sure nothing bad happens to my ship. So uh, together, we work together. We integrate him into the team. And uh, usually we, we have what's officially known as the Master Pilot Exchange. When he comes up on board, we, uh, when he gets to the bridge, we give him a cup of coffee or water or whatever he wants, the donut. And, uh, you know, and I'll tell him, you know, yes, pilot, everything's working. You know, anchors are ready. Everybody's standing by. The plan is to start the thrusters here, we'll entering the port with such and such a speed. And he'll agree or not, say, no, Kevin, that speed's a little high. We want to keep it to six knots. Okay. Because they have speed limits on the ports and so forth. And there might be uh, circumstances in the port which might um, change the way it's done today. Let's say there's a tanker at the berth and he's extra big than usual and we want to go by him extra slow. I wasn't aware of that. Or um, Carnival came in and ran over the buoy and dragged it out of position. <laughs> and we need to watch out for that. Things like that, you know, the bollard number six is broken. We want to make sure we don't put our lines on that. And, uh, so he never takes the help. Sometimes they do, but he's always working for the captain. In other words, he's hired help in that respect. So only place they would do that would be Miami steering down the channel. And that's just the, ch the channel keeper. And uh, the captain's always responsible, so whatever he does is my fault. And whatever anybody does is my fault. So that goes with the territory, but that gives me the ability to, to decide and uh, do what I feel is necessary to keep the ship safe. So that's the role of the pilot, and it's quite different in different ports. Uh, in, let's say, Haiti, for example, we don't take any pilot. In St. Martin, um, great bunch of guys. We come in, and they're only there for arrivals. They don't come for departures. Um, they don't ever take the helm or never take any responsibility in that respect. Uh, but uh, we know them all. We're in and out of these ports every day. 
So I know Fred, I know Jack, I know Mike, you know. I know what kind of coffee they drink. And some of them are loud, some are quiet. Some need a donut, some don't. And when this, uh, when this ship uh, first launched, we did a little short uh, European season before we made our home uh, over here, which uh, I suppose the pilot's captain really played a, a good role in communication because when you're pulling into Italy, they speak Italian and English. If they pull into France, they speak French and English. So the, this is where the pilot's value comes in, is, is ensuring that there's good communication in the port. So oftentimes ships will come from very far away parts of the world, maybe English isn't their first language. It's the international language for shipping, just like it is in the air industry. So um, yeah, and that's that's one of the primary roles we play. It's all the way in the back, yes. I have two questions, I'm Sharon from Mexico. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, is a ship will cruise the a Panama Canal, this is the first one. And the second one is, what will be the hardest situation or decision that you have made in your history of being a director? Okay. Well, first off, uh, we won't fit in the Panama Canal unless we go really fast. <laughs> <laughs> No, we don't want to do that. But um, no, we are. In fact, we are just too big. So ships that are built to go through the Panama Canal are known as Panamax. They're built to the maximum size that the Panama Canal can take. Now, we just built a new Panama Canal next to the old Panama Canal. So the old Panamax ships in our fleet would be, for example, the Vision class ships and the Radiance class ships. They're built to less than 1,000 feet and less than 107 feet wide. So the Panama Canal is 110 feet wide and 1,000 feet long. And uh, Panamax ships are just less than that. So our ships are 106 feet wide. That gives you two feet of clearance on both sides. And they're about 900 feet long, so it gives you 50 feet on each end. And um, it's tight, but it'll fit. Then they built the new canal but they didn't build it big enough for Oasis class. So we don't fit in that one either. So, but we weren't really meant to. That wasn't the plan uh, from the beginning. So these ships were built primarily for the Caribbean and this run that we're on right now. Um, that said, we've, we've sailed all over Europe and um, these ships can do well in Europe. But their primary purpose was the Caribbean. One of the reasons for that is uh, we have Central Park. And um, you know, we plant Central Park, tropical paradise that it is up there, but if you go into a cold climate, it'll be like fall and winter. And then we have to replant Central Park, which we did when we came back from Europe. We, uh, we had an agreement with one of the um, uh, nurseries in, in South Florida, and uh, when we came over from Europe this time, we offloaded a bunch of big trees and plants and put on board a bunch of new ones for the tropics. And the hardest decision I've ever made is a good question. I don't know. That's a tough one. I'll think about that. How's that? All right, next question. All the way in the back. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Danelle from Ohio. Captain, was there an application process that you had to go through in order to be chosen for the ship? No, it involved a hat and some names. <laughs> <laughs> I drew the what? short straw, I guess. <laughs> you could say. No dartboard? No, what? Dartboard, yeah. No, um, yeah, th there's a process. Um, let me just explain in general how it works. We, periodically, the company will ask all the captains what's their top three choices and uh, we get the opportunity to tell them my first choice would be you know freedom of the seas my next choice would be um, grandeur of the seas and my next choice would be uh, emperors and then um, they'll just go send you wherever they need <laughs> it's nice that they ask yes nice that they ask and that's pretty much where it ends that said they asked me to come to symphony and i was Happy to do it. It's been an amazing year. 
Um, we started in November last year in the shipyard in France, and uh, we were six months from completion. So it was a really huge construction site, as you can imagine. None of this was finished. There were cranes and tiles were up, and you can't imagine what it looked like. It's really hard to describe. And when you first get here, you just look around and you go, how are we ever going to finish this on time? And that's our mission, you know, as the captain and, and I come with a small team early on, in, in this case in November, our first cruise in April. Um, we were tasked primarily with keeping track of the progress and ensuring that the resources are directed in the right areas so we can finish on time. And with that, we are given direct access to those who can make those decisions. So that was a very interesting process. It's um, hugely demanding. I lived in an apartment. I drove to work in a car every day like normal people. Uh, we didn't move on board the ship until February. And um, every day, drive to work in the morning before the sun came up and leave in the evening when the sun had long gone down. I did my own laundry, I cooked for myself, I did all of that. How did you ever laundry? Yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. No, really, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. And uh, I burned a few pots of stew in my little apartment, but I learned how to do it. It was good fun. We used the system of S-curves to manage and monitor the progress in certain areas and, and knowing that you know we have to finish projects at a certain rate in order to be complete on time. And when that rate was diverging from what it's supposed to be, we knew we were falling behind. And we had to correct that curve. And that meant directing the resources to do that. And it's a process that takes time, but you have to attend all the meetings, you have to be there with the foreman and, and all the guys who are making it happen. Very interesting process. There's a lot riding on it. We really had to be finished for our first cruises. And Symphony, I will say, was the smoothest takeout in the history of the company. We were done on our first cruise, and that's very unusual to be as complete as we were. So, really it's true, this was the smoothest, and we refer to it as a flawless takeout. So that was our mission, to have a flawless takeout, and really I think we achieved it. It was remarkable uh, how it all came together. Credit to the team, both in the shipyard and on board. Excellent, next question back here. Um, I'm Ray Pam. Uh, what was your most memorable experience so far on the Symphony of the Seas? Most memorable experience? Wow. You, you first. Me first. Um, most this moment right here sitting with all of you. Uh, isn't that nice? No. Um, <laughs> I love you all, but uh, I would say, and I, I, I'm not sure, well, uh, you have probably more memorable ones, but uh, the naming ceremony. The naming ceremony of the ship, it goes back uh, a long history uh, in maritime tradition of naming uh, a ship, having a, a godmother, or in our case, we have a god family, uh, the Pinnavega family, uh, where they christen the ship, they crash the champagne bottle uh, against the side of the, uh, of the ship, and it's just a really a beautiful ceremony and a lot of rich tradition, and uh, you know, from the blessing of the ship all the way through. And I had a great seat. I was in about the ninth row. Captain, you were in what row were you in? I can't remember, but it was somewhere in the front. Yeah, yeah, he was in the front row. Anyway, actually, no, front front row, like on the stage. There you go. Anyway, uh, but it was uh, it was a really really nice uh, tradition because I guess at the end of the day, this ship, when you think about it in the grand scheme of things, will be sailing these waters for 40, 50 years, so long as you know she's maintained uh, as well as we know that she can be. And uh, knowing that I was there in the very beginning with the christening of the ship, it's something that I can, you know, tell my kids and my grandkids that, yeah, I was there. That's, no, that's really true. I mean, I think that you're spot on. I, we did uh, the naming ceremony in Miami when we came over, breaking the bottle and doing the very traditional one. But we also did the handover in the yard when we sailed from St. Nazaire, France, just before we sailed. 
we had a very big ceremony with the shipyard where the shipyard basically hands us the ship. And Richard Fain, our chairman and CEO, signed the check for one and a half billion dollars and they gave us the keys. And that was a very interesting moment. And um, it was, we did it on stage in the theater, in this case, and that was early on. That was in um, the end of March. And I remember that moment too. That was where we lowered the French flag and raised the Bahamian flag together with the American flag. And, and we really took, took control of the ship. It was our ship at that point. But we saved the naming ceremony until we came to Miami when we came to the new terminal. And there were the fireworks and, and the whole traditional package. Uh, that, that, was, that was definitely a moment. But I also remember the one where we took it from the shipyard and, and that was really significant. We were very tired. We were exhausted from what we had been through and that, that was kind of emotional when we took, took control. It was truly our ship. And as a captain, I can tell you that was that was something for me. I'll never forget. Very nice. All right, Mark uh, Rowe, right My name is Philip Yankovsky from Los Angeles. Uh, <clears throat> I've been on a number of Royal Caribbean cruises. This is the first time that I can recall that uh, there was any event um, that was set aside for veterans uh, to socialize. Uh, is this the first time that Royal Caribbean has done this? No, no, go ahead. I, I, I've been hosting veterans get together. I've been with the company for 15 years, and I would say I became the cruise director in 2006. So I've been doing this for, for years. Yeah. And a lot of times, it, it, it kind of varies uh, varies by ship and demographic and whatnot, but I, yeah. Um, so not great. all the Royal Caribbean ships have that? No, no, we, for the most part, I, I as far as I know, um, yeah. It's, a, it's always a nice gathering. That's coming up here at 11 o'clock right here after this. So if you are a veteran, please stick around. All right. Yes. Uh, my name's Don Craig from England. I've got a technical question. We weigh 225,000 tons. How much can we actually weigh before she goes below? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the measurement uh, gross tons, which yeah. is how we measure and 225,000 gross tons is actually a measurement of volume, not weight. So a gross ton is 100 cubic feet. And it's measuring the internal volume of the ship. The reason we do that, in the commercial world, we don't really concern ourselves as much as how much the ship itself weighs, but more about how much it can carry, because that's its value. So we measure ships by gross tons. Now, a cruise ship typically has a lot of volume with all the interior spaces. So our tonnage can be quite high, but we don't weigh a lot because we're hollow. So on this ship, we are, even though we're 225,000 gross tons, we are 106 displacement tons, 106,000 displacement. That's how much we actually weigh. If we put it in the bathtub, that's how much water would come out, how much she weighs. So, how much will it take to make her go glug? Uh, a whole lot more than we could probably get on right now. I mean, you couldn't do it. No, you couldn't fit enough on here to make it go glug. You can make it go down in the water enough, but you just couldn't do it because the structure itself couldn't, couldn't hold the that it would take, if you know what I mean. We're built to a certain strength standard for her mission. And the mission is what we're doing now. Okay. Happy to hear that. Now we, we should be good, at least until my end. Yeah, I think so. So far, so good. Excellent. Thanks for Good I'm Donna Berger from Las Vegas. What I want to ask you is, are they going to do uh, a 10 day run eventually? Maybe. I think a lot of people love to do a 10 day instead of back to back. If you can answer that, that'd be great. You, you want to do a back-to-back -back crew? Doing, instead of doing a seven-day, seven-day, doing a ten-day Instead day of back-to-back, -back, a ten-day run, just like different ports. Just a ten-day run. Well, you know what? If you do a back-to-back, -back, that's 14 days, and it's different ports, so it's the same thing. South. South. Like oh, southern. Southern. Yeah. 
Well, you know, never rule it out. At this point, this class is shaped the way we find the business works the best is one week cruises. That does limit us to how far south we can get. If we really want to get to Curacao, Aruba, Bonaire, the rest of the islands south, um, Antigua, etc., um, it takes more days if we want to leave from Miami. So that's why we have a ship in San Juan. And if you run out of San Juan, you can go all the way down and back, and, but you have to fly yourself to San Juan. So, with that said, um, long cruises generally no on Oasis class ships, unless you're doing a crossing. So, Oasis is headed to Europe in the spring, and that will be a long cruise. I think it will probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 weeks, maybe 12. And it will be many sea days, but you will leave from, let's see, Port Canaveral, and you'll end up in Spain and a few places in between. But that's the exception. And, and when Oasis does come back to the United States, uh, it's going to be based out of Bayonne. And Bayonne, New Jersey, often uh, being as far north as it is, it will be doing its traditional seven-day runs down to the uh, down to the Bahamas and Perfect Day on a private island, et cetera, et cetera. But there may actually be, and I haven't looked at the, uh, the deployment, but there may be uh, a couple of cruises that do go seven-plus days However, um, it wouldn't be all the way as far south as I think that you're wanting to go. So, all right. Very good. Next question. Hi, uh, my name is Grace. I'm from Canada. I was just wondering what kind of fuel you use and what the impact is on the surrounding aquatic ecosystem. We burn uh, what we call HFO, heavy fuel oil. It's black, it's thick, it's like molasses at room temperature. So we have to heat it up and make it thin so we can filter it and pump it to the diesel engine. It's an interesting question because there's a lot to it. The, the fuel or energy density of this fuel is as good as it gets until you get to nuclear power or nuclear you know, fission. It's, there's that much energy per volume. It's about 45% uh, more dense than gasoline <coughs> per pound per heat factor that we get out of it, how many BTUs per kilogram. So we get a lot of horsepower out of this fuel in other words. We're burning it right now at about 42% thermal efficiency, which is as good as it can be. Uh, we have similar diesel engines um, as a power plant ashore, and they're similar um, efficiency, thermal efficiency. To put it in perspective, your economy car, your Prius, let's say, is getting about 25 to 30 at the most thermal efficiency. So we are much more efficient in that respect, burning this, this heavy oil. And that's because the engines turn at a low RPM and there's less friction loss. A high-speed engine loses a lot of heat in friction. And that's why automobile engines aren't that efficient as compared to a slow-turning big diesel. Now, we have to deal with the emissions from this, and there's two, two kinds of emissions. There's the CO2, which we can't do anything about, but there's the particulates. And in this case, you're gonna have sulfur, sulfuric acid compounds that come from the sulfur in the oil, and you're gonna have some carbon and uh, nitrates. So the scrubber system that we have on board, the, what we call the AEP, Advanced Emission Purification Plant, washes the stack gas coming out of the smokestack. That's really important that you know that. When you look up and you see what looks like white smoke pouring out of it, that's really vapor. It's water vapor. It looks like smoke. It lingers like smoke, but it's really not. It's, it's water vapor mixed with a little bit of caustic soda, which neutralizes the acids, the sulfuric acid, in that smoke. We capture that uh, wash water and we save it. And we land it in Miami and where it goes back to the um, refinery and it's reprocessed. So that's a big deal for us to have these scrubbers. And we've 
fitted them on all the new ships, and we've retrofitted them on all the old ships. On this ship, for example now, we are 25% more fuel efficient than our sister ship Oasis, the first of the class. We've done this a number of different ways, by using uh, air lubrication on the hull, or pump air bubbles under the hull from the forward end of the ship. The air bubbles ride along underneath the ship and we slide through the water more easily. We use the latest generation of silicone paint. We um, have a slightly different hull shape. We have new propellers, which are more efficient, even than Harmony. And we have a steam generator, which probably gives the most. And there, the heat from the smokestack goes into what's known as an economizer. It makes steam from the heat. It runs a generator, which generates electricity and gives it to the board, the switchboard. And that's good for five megawatts, this is a lot. So all of those things combined gives us greater efficiency, plus all the LED lighting in that is also very good. So all these things combined, we're, we're at probably the most efficient as we can be at this point with technology. And uh, the next step is, is LNG, which is cleaner. But the problem with LNG is its volume. It's not very dense. So it takes up a lot of space. You have to compress it. And it makes a lot of CO2, because you have to burn twice as much. So where do you find the balance? It's not. And uh, the test will be at 4 p.m. in the dining room on the floor. I hope everybody picked up on it. Excellent. Right over here. Yes, sir. I'm Barry Catch, Houston, Texas. We've been on all four of the Oasis class ships, and there's an evolution in what's on the ship. How do you guys make a decision as to what to keep and what to try and do? Because you know, things in restaurants change, shops change, everything sort of has a different footprint. Uh, what's, what's the decision making process? Abe, hey, I know you can answer this one well. You go ahead. Uh, it, it, it comes down to you. It comes down to the guests, uh, the feedback of our guests, what you want, trends in the industry, uh, and also, uh, as kind of Captain has uh, mentioned with the environmental standard, uh, when it comes to uh, the trends in the industry and what it is that uh, you as guests want. They change over time. And, uh, for example, the uh, boardwalk itself has changed. We had Sugar Beach on a couple of uh, ships, and then we put uh, a couple of retail shops and uh, yeah, uh, just shopping back there on the Harmony. And then everybody came on board. They go, "Whoa, oh, where's where's Sugar Beach? We want Sugar Beach." So of course we put back Sugar Beach. Uh, the uh, sports bar concept of Playmakers completely. Uh, uh, changed that whole area on our other ships. We've got Mexican restaurants, and uh, it started off as a, a, a seafood restaurant, I think, on Oasis, but then it came uh, came back to Mexican. Now we just put in a massive sports bar, which has been an amazing, amazing success uh, back there. Then we move our, our Mexican restaurant, uh, uh, more of a to-go option upstairs, and then we put the seafood restaurant uh, where on the other ships, on deck 16 in the Solarium, it was not a very efficiently used space. Uh, hardly ever got, it's square footage on board a ship is always very valuable. Uh, we can't just build a wing on if we want to expand, so we need to take every square foot uh, into account. And in this particular case with uh, the deck 16 forward in Solarium, we thought this is such great space, but it rarely gets used. Let's enclose it and put a, a, a wonderful seafood restaurant in there and, and did that. Uh, same with the Solarium Bistro, kind of adding that concept. And they forgot to put a, a, a pool on the Harmony in the Solarium, so they got that one right on here. Uh, and a few more of them. Yeah, yeah and, and this is the evolution of, of the design as we move forward, right? And we've learned a lot of lessons with the older ships. So this is where we're at now on Symphony. What we will do is roll back a lot of the features that are on Symphony to the older ships. So for example, um, Oasis is going into dry dock in the fall in Cadiz, Spain, after she does her Mediterranean cruises. And they will invest over 250 million in new Oasis, and she will get a lot of the same features that we have here. I know on Harmony, for example, they move Starbucks to the boardwalk. They're gonna move it back. Everybody likes it here, including me. And so, 
Not that that matters. So it's closer to our office, the bridge. It's closer. Just some examples. You know, we move things, we move them back, we change things. It's a success. No, it's not. We change it. We're pretty quick to make changes where we, where we feel it's needed. It's, there's quite a science behind it. Uh, and, and even you when know, I'm talking about square footage, how important it is, we even took our car that was a normal size and kind of put it into a car crusher and just balled that thing up so we could give it you know, a little extra space there. <laughs> Next question here. Uh, Donna from Sarasota, Florida. 2,200 crew on board. How many countries are represented? Oh, we're close to 90. 90 different nationalities within our crew. Between 80 and 90, depending on the on the cruise. Every week we have crew going home and crew coming on board. So we're probably averaging about 100 crew a week coming and going. So that number changes a little bit. But it's generally between 80 and 90. We're very diverse. Along with that, um, you, were, you were talking about doing different things on different ships. Is there any possibility that the Oasis, Oasis class ships will have the parade of flags, which is one of the most fun, entertaining, and it highlights your crew. It's a wonderful event. I know it is. I mean, the, we never did it on the biggest ships. It was usually the smaller ships that we would do that. Instead, we do the parade, and Dave, hey, you can highlight that one. But that's actually a 1245 along here. And, uh, yeah, the parade of flags, it is a, it is a nice uh, nice touch and a nice uh, feel to it, but when it comes to these uh, larger ships, we do the, the big, big parade. Parade of flags was always just kind of a, oh, we don't have a royal power on the do a normal parade, so let's just wave a bunch of flags together. But it's a great, great concept. It's really, really quite nice. Just a bit. Question. Then we have time for just a couple more questions here, folks. Uh, Todd from Ohio. Just wondering when you're assigned a new ship captain, uh, does your work schedule change for on and off fleets to kind of keep that continuity through build and handover? Yes, it does. And um, whenever we move from one ship to another, our schedules have to be adjusted to fit again. So um, we work 10 weeks on, 10 weeks off. I'm going home with you on Saturday. Not you, but. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Seattle when I heard his rain. The, um, my reliever is coming to replace me, so every ship has two captains. One's home on vacation doing the dishes and painting the house and feeding the cat, and the other one's here you know, having fun. And um, when we do move, we're usually assigned to ship three, four years at a time, give or take. I've spent up to four and a half years on one ship and a year and a half on another, so it's fairly flexible. And it really kind of depends. So my schedule, for example, on the new build, I was straight through. I had a couple weeks off for Christmas last year, and it was from November all the way to the end of March, first part of April. So that's a unique situation, but that's how it worked. And now, that's one thing about the Symphony, is, is she's such a new ship, and we had all the crew arrive the massive crew will arrive in February, which means many of them are coming due to the end of their contract in the fall. And we had to split them up so that they all didn't go home at the same time. So for a new ship, everybody's got to be flexible. We're at the point now where most everybody has gone home once, or maybe twice, and uh, those schedules just continue to be spread out for the next year and a half. Time for one more question, and then the captain has his captain's uh, uh, coffee with the captain, if we can continue on and do some photos and everything over by Starbucks. But let's go to the next one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for taking the question. Uh, my name is uh, Rajeshwar Mote from Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm really from India. Uh, I just want to ask for one question, like, uh, how do you treat this waste material uh, in the ship? There is a lot of trash and uh, how do you do that? Recycling. What do we do with all the trash? Oh, what do we do with all the trash? Well, yeah, we're um, recycling up to 73% of all our consumables. And um, we've achieved zero landfill. So that's really a big, big one for us. We, we recycle all the glass, all the metal, all the paper, and all the plastic. Whatever we can't recycle, we burn. And we make it to ash. 
that ash is landed in a gasification uh, plant where they take basically garbage and they make gas out of it and they burn it for electricity. So nothing goes to the landfill. And that's generating electricity in Fort Lauderdale. We don't actually land that much. It's very, very little. I mean, ash is like a couple of cubic meters and that's it. And there's not much left of it. But um, you'll see bundles and bundles of pallets um, with crushed cans and strapped up cardboard because everything, all our supplies comes in cardboard boxes. And so every, uh, every week, you know, we have piles of cardboard and we have a special machine that crushes it and straps it up. And you'll see it on turnaround day tomorrow. If you were to hang around on the pier, you'd see it going off first thing. And it's trucked off at the recycling plant. And one, and one little uh, bit may I add, uh, which is something that I think, it, it's not known, but I think it should be a little bit more. Uh, the crew work exceptionally hard. Your stateroom attendants, uh, the cleaners, everybody running around the ship, they, 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 they separate and they, they take everything. And to give even more motivation, obviously recycling is big business. It's a, it's a trillion dollar business worldwide when it comes to this. The ship would obviously, landing so much, would get money for the recycling. But the money itself that we get from the recycling does not actually go into the profit. It actually goes back to the crew. We have a crew welfare fund on board the ship that does things like Christmas parties and big, huge, lavish buffets that you guys never get to see and new karaoke machines. We have an incredible room, and I know I'm going to make some guys jealous here, uh, where we have probably 24 Xboxes that are all set up and Playstations and screens where the crew gets to just hang out and relax. What you all see as guests is only about uh, maybe 60% of the actual ship. 40% behind the scenes, a lot of technical spaces, galleys and whatnot, but so much of it is actually recreational areas, specifically for crew. So when you, when they, you know, punch the clock and they go off and work, uh, everything from coffee shops to three different bars and nightclubs and restaurants and so many different places for, uh, for them to relax and enjoy. And uh, so much of that actually comes from the hard work that they do when it comes to recycling. So I always thought that that's always a nice little bit that not many people, not many people uh, know and understand, but it's, uh, it's nice to, to see that. That's been that way at least since, since I've joined the company 15 years ago. Okay. All right, well, thank you everybody for your wonderful questions here today. Thank Thanks for watching and make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video. Also make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next videos I will be posting and leave your questions, comments, and suggestions below.